Welcome to The Infidel, podcast of the damned, the weekly companion show of the Infidel News. Join us as we discuss this week's religious accounts from an atheist perspective. From Timbuktu to Toledo, from Kathmandu to Canada, from Bangalore to Bangladesh, we deplore, you deride. And here are your hosts, Dave and Nicole. Hello and welcome to show number 34 of the Infidel Podcast of the Damned. I'm your host, atheist and author J. David Cork, and with me is my co-host, the extraordinaire Nicole Simard. Hello, Yay, Nicole. Hey, here's Nicole, and he's not doing a product placement. I know. <laughs> um, also joining us today is Jax Rula of the Sacred Secular Sanctuary. Welcome to the show, Jax. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Nice to be here. Today is Friday, September 25th, 2015, and we're going to be discussing the upcoming episodes of the Infidel News, which will run beginning Monday, September 28th, 2015. Today's newsreader is Onk Infinitus. Show notes for all of our podcasts can be found at infidelpodcast.blogspot.com. So, um, Jax, that's an interesting name. Is that, a, is that an alias or is that your actual name? Uh, well, my name is Jacqueline, which is really long, and no one can spell it. So, Jax is much easier, especially when I'm texting and stuff. Okay, <laughs> very good. Um, and uh, so, and you're with the uh, the Sacred Secular Sanctuary. That's right. Now, is this um is this an actual physical place, or is it an online sanctuary? Uh, it's a not for profit organization that I co founded a couple of years ago with a few friends of mine, and it's a an organization that we created so we could really create community and uh, and events for atheists and secularists and humanists in our area. I Why see. the so, word uh, sacred? Why the word sacred in it? Well, it, it, it kind of came out of the idea of one of my friends who do, took um, the El Camino walk across the top of Spain. And I and it was a wonderful experience for her. I think it took her six weeks to walk across the top of Spain. And it was interesting because, you know, being an atheist and doing that walk, you're doing it for, you know, a different reason than most people. And when she came back, I thought to myself, why do you have to go all the way to Spain to have a sacred experience that, um, like, why can't you do that on your own? land? Why can't we do that here? And so we got into this conversation about, about creating the sacred outside of the church and outside of religious dogma, cre understanding that our lives can be sacred without all of that extra baggage. And, and so it kind of developed out of that process. Right. Because sacred doesn't necessarily denote um, uh, religious it's because it you know, like people hold their family sacred. Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah. Hmm. That, um, and, and I noticed I saw I saw on your on your uh, homepage um, that you have a, an emblem that you use. It's like um, three three little spirals that kind of like a throwing star kind of a shape. It, it is. It's actually on my t-shirt. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's I've... backwards. I've noticed. <laughs> on <you. laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, this is a really, really old, old symbol that comes from you know pre-written history, mm -hmm. and so we re we are reclaiming it. We're we're taking it from really the spiral is is reused by many, many peoples throughout history, but the original use of the spiral, we really have no idea what those original people who were carving it on the stones in ancient Iraq, we didn't really know what they were thinking when they were doing it. It was such an ancient symbol. Now, as, uh, as you know, I progressed through my mythological life to reach atheism, I passed many forms, including paganism and goddess stuff and things like that. And the spiral was always talked about as a symbol of rejuvenation and, and rebirth and reworking, you know, coming back and doing things over and over again, which, which I like the idea because, you know, our, our seasons work in a spiral and, and our solar system actually travels in a spiral. So it's that kind of a reclaiming. Right. It was very important in sacred geometry, the spiral, and it, uh, uh, it uh, mathematically, it uh, uh, all that um, the uh, like the Nautilus spiral and the galaxy spiral and the uh, spiral that you find in sunflower, etc. They're all based on the Fibonacci sequence. Right. The the wonderful golden mean that everybody sure. says proves the existence of God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we all got to laugh out of that one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah. Um, so uh, tell us exactly where your community is located uh, and how far it spreads. Well, we are in Waterloo, Ontario, and we don't really have a specific place. We've been meeting at a, at a senior's home called Lanark, actually. They've been giving us room for free. And so we've been doing uh, all sorts of meetings there for several years. But we also meet into in each other's homes, and we do other projects together. So those projects take place wherever they take place, like like the conference, the non-con that we, we uh, volunteer organized this year with uh, Spencer Lucas. Mm -hmm. Mm, that's the non-con, oh. which is uh, covered on my channel, uh, people can start seeing uh, some of the uh, conference uh, guests. Uh, uh, two of them are up on my channel right now. Yes, nice to see those. Thanks very much. How many? How many um, uh, members do you have? We're, you know, we're a small group. When we <laughs> when we started, we had all of our girlfriends from our pagany goddess days really want to support us. And then we read them the nine principles, so they dropped off dramatically the first year. <laughs> um, so we are a group of about uh, paying members, about 10 to 15, but we're all very, very dedicated to the projects that we take on. And, uh, and of course, then we invite other people to come into our, our group and, and slowly start to expand it. We're only about three years old. Oh, um, you say you, uh, you, pay, you have uh, paying members, so uh, the dues go towards paying for um, the uh, things that you do? Any, any of the projects that we want to take on, yes. The mm -hmm. dues are $40 a year. Okay, that's not terrible. Mm -hmm. that's, yeah. um, so do you ever um, do like any of the um, meetup things with other, other secularist, secular, secularist groups? Well, you know, a lot of the other secularist groups cover those kind of social meetups, uh, whereas we tend to be more active. So on our second year, we actually had a presence at the World Religious Conference, where our president um, spoke for humanism. And, uh, and then this year, of course, most of our time was dedicated to organizing the conference. It was the first time we had ever done such a thing. Well, wonderful experience, and I'm really glad the way it turned out. Uh, but now we actually are going to sit down and decide what our next project is. We've done some work about, around palliative care and wanting to supply um, atheists, atheists volunteering to people who require palliative care and seniors and that sort of thing to give them an alternative. So we all went and took a palliative care course together and uh, have had some speakers in talking to us about dying with dignity, which, you know, passed recently in Canada, so yay. Yeah. And and, uh, and so that's the sort of thing we're working on now. Kind of have to sit down, I'm actually the ritual committee for the sanctuary, have to sit down and create secular rituals for rites of passage for atheists, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's cool. Um, the, uh, uh, I don't know if, if um, you've ever heard of uh, have you ever heard of death by air or uh, burial by air? What, where you put the body way up high and have the birds pick it to the bones? Right. Yes. Yeah. Right. Okay. So what you have there, uh, that's the, uh, you know, the, you have the four elements, right? The, yeah. the, the ancient four elements. I've always told my family that I, that as far, as far as like burial goes, when, when to disposal of my body, um, I want to be cremated for, for uh, fire and then half of my ashes buried for earth and then a, a, another quarter of them scattered to the wind, and then the remainder put in a suet ball. And look, <laughs> <laughs> well, that's very <laughs> elemental. <laughs> <laughs> I actually like the idea of the new composting system they've set up. I think it's in Seattle. <laughs> yeah, I've seen that where they make, where they put you make the roots of a tree. They no, they they have this huge compost burial site where your body goes into the top of this huge compost pile. And, uh, and they let you rot, and then the compost comes out at the end, probably several years later, and it gets added to the wonderful garden that people can go and, and you know, contemplate their loved ones. Yeah, they always tell you, like, when you're composting, they tell you not to put meat. <laughs> they know. This must be a special one with special chemicals. It's in a special building. <laughs> Yeah. There's also, there's that pod. Have you seen that pod they, where they put you, they, they put you in fetal position and they put you in a bag and they bury you in the ground um, in fetal position. And then they bear, they, they plant a tree over top of you. So as the roots grow, they break open this pod and uh, use you as nourishment. Well, that's nice. That, 
that's a nice idea. I, you know, I, I'm concerned about space. So I think, you know, a nice cremation and a spreading over the garden is fine for me. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's what I'm not, I'm not concerned about. I've, you know, I've got a question for you. You talked about the nine principles. What are they? Uh, well, it, it's a document that took us uh, quite some time to craft, and it's it's very in depth. Um, but it includes. I'm going to look up my little document here, and actually have to put on my glasses for this one. I can give you a little read of some of these if you're interested. Um, the first one is: We revere and celebrate the universe as the totality of being, past, present, and future. It is self-organizing, ever-evolving, and inexhaustibly diverse. Its overwhelming power, beauty, and fundamental mystery compel the deepest human reverence and wonder. So that's principle number one. Um, number two, all matter, energy, and life are an interconnected unity of which we are an inseparable part. We rejoice in our existence and seek to participate er ever more deeply in this unity through knowledge, celebration, meditation, empathy, love, ethical action, and art. Um, so, you know, they're, they're all quite in-depth like this, where we had problems with our goddess friends was number six here. So I'm going to jump down to number six for you. We see death as the return to nature of our elements and the end of our existence as individuals. The forms of afterlife available to humans are natural ones in the natural world. Our actions, our ideas, and memories of us live on according to what we do in our lives. Our genes live on in our families, and our elements are endlessly recycled in nature. Uh, so, you know, they're, 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 they were that kind of in-depth. Shall I continue? Do you want to... No, I, we can we can I can I, we can link to them. That gives you an idea. Yeah, they're yeah. on our site, um, sacredsecularsanctuary.com, okay. uh, along with uh, all the other information about about the sanctuary. Okay, cool. Um, what was their specific objection to that, though? I don't yeah, understand. What really, it basically said there's no such thing as a soul, and when you die, you die. Deal with it, right? Like. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and this 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 whole process of getting people over the idea that somehow our consciousness survives as a single entity in the afterlife is just, I don't know, it's, it's a stretch to me. You know, you know, it's like the ego desperately trying to make itself important after death. And so a lot of people, they just couldn't agree to that one. <laughs> when you were going through your goddess stage, was that something that you struggled with at the time? Or did you just, just say, yeah, we must live on after, after no, not at all. You know, I um, I never really assumed that any of these deities or goddesses were an entity outside of myself. I've always just assumed that they were aspects of within ourselves. Um, and and I actually, I guess I was lucky. I came from um, the background where my mother knew that when we died, we died, and she would say to me, "Nothing happens. Nothing. You're dead." It's all mm -hmm. dark, <laughs> which was, you know, nice of her, but terrifying at the same time for a young yeah. person. <laughs> but yeah. it, it, it was real, and I think probably one of the steps that took me to where I am today, actually. Yeah, yeah. Too many people worry about their kids being frightened by these, by the facts, that, and and that, you know they don't want to. Like they get upset when, like my sister is is Catholic, and when my nieces and nephews were little. Um, they would, they would, you know, try to talk to me about uh, God and stuff like that, and my sister would just come and grab them and take them away because she didn't want them to hear what I had to say at all. And I would not, you know, I wouldn't be, you know, you know, I, I just, I have my own kids, and when I raise my own kids, I let them come to their own conclusions, and th you know, they weren't, they weren't terrified, they weren't mortified, you know. So I don't understand why anybody, the, people do worry about that. They they get terrified that. Uh, well, and, you know, for me, the whole idea of not having to worry about an afterlife or not having to worry about what's happening to a soul is hugely re relieving. I, I, I really like the idea that it's just now. So we better take care of it right now. You know, right. there's no second chance. So get it right the first time. Right. I think it's like that comes easier that way. Yeah, I think it's, it's like that line from Conan the Barbarian. <laughs> that uh, um, Sonia, I think, uh, says, uh, uh, do you want to live forever? 
you know, like, like, why would you want that? <laughs> right. And it's, of course, no, you know, life is all just about the present moment and enjoy it while it's happening. Yeah. yeah. Of course, and there is, there is a process too about taking responsibility. And, and this is where the, you know, the religious mind, it says, well, now that you don't have to care for your soul, you can start eating babies. What's keeping you from eating babies? Which I always think is hilarious. Like it's going to be the top of your menu list. Yeah. So in in our aims, our our last aim for the sanctuary is um, that as a sanctuary, we want to foster moral and ethical attitudes with the understanding that the privileges and obligations of our lives are our responsibility. Um, there's there's this wonderful idea of you know doing good deeds for the sake of being good and not for reward afterwards, and uh, and taking responsibility for your actions in the here and now, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, you said you were telling us before we came on online about an interesting conversation that you'd had recently with uh, somebody about um, the, 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 the difference between hard and soft atheism. And, and you said somebody, there was a person who was angry with you for the, for the stance that you took. Do you want to go ahead and... Uh, his, his argument was uh, that whole idea that because we can't know that God really exists, we also can't know that God doesn't exist. So as an atheist, you undermine atheism by saying, I know God doesn't exist mm -hmm. because he thinks that that's impossible. He right. says that we have to say, I believe God doesn't exist. And so he got into this argument about semantics between know and believe. And for me, I'm not a wishy-washy person. When I make a decision, I go there, right? So um, for me, by saying, I believe God doesn't exist is kind of the equivalent of saying, okay, or, I know he exists, but I'm going to just choose not to believe in him, which to me is fence sitting. I, I don't do that. I know God doesn't exist. And my argument comes to the idea that nobody who wants to describe what they think this God being is can actually agree on a definition in right. any way whatsoever. So as long as they are arguing definition, I'm going to say, I know this doesn't exist. Right. And but yeah. Yeah, my position is um, I accept that there may be something that somebody who defines as God exists, but I don't define that thing as God because what God would be to me would be something that is um, uh, intention has intent, um, uh, is uh, um, uh, ever existing and and cognizant of itself and worthy of worship. And that thing, which does not exist, it, it, it absolutely does not exist. So I'm, in, I'm with you in that sense. Give me a definition of God and whatever that definition is, it doesn't exist. But that doesn't mean that if somebody else has an idea of God that actually is something that is out there, like for example, just um, the fact that the, 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 uni the universe, it's the, the omniverse, they, if they call the, if they want to call the omnivorous God, that's fine. Then God exists. But and no, but, I don't fall for that because that's not God. That's the omnivorous. Right. That's my. That's my. Right? Point. Like you can't just say, oh, this thing's existing, so I'm going to call it God. That proves God exists. Right. That that's a cop out. Um, for for me, it's it's like saying it's like saying to you, okay, I'm imagining um, Santa Claus right now. So because I've imagined Santa Claus. You have to believe that there's a possibility that Santa Claus actually exists now until we prove that he doesn't. And of course, my argument to you is, do you really, do you know that Santa doesn't exist? Sorry, kids, but do you know that Santa doesn't exist or do you just believe that Santa doesn't exist? Yeah, well, and, and that's the thing, but the thing about atheism as a word is that there are, there are so many different ways to apply it. And if all you're applying it to is, and a lot of this is the way a lot of atheists apply it, is a lack of belief in a god, you know, just I lack, I lack a belief in a god, therefore I'm an atheist. That actually does have a wider spectrum where there can be people that fall in there that don't know, and and, and think it's possible, but they don't have a belief in that thing. Sure, but and, that makes them agnostic. No, well, it doesn't make them agnostic. It makes them agnostic atheists. 
oh, okay. <laughs> That's because, like a Christian Jew. I don't get that. <laughs> no, well, because agnostic, a, a pure agnostic is somebody who thinks it's a 50-50 proposition. A, a pure agnostic, I understand, is someone who believes that God exists but is unknowable, so I'm not even going to try. Nah. But no, that, See, would be a, that would be a theist. <laughs> yeah. yeah. In my case, for example, uh, I do not know of any exist proof of an existence of a God. So I say that as far as I know, there is no God. If you want to believe in a God or if you don't want to believe in a God or if you want to say that there is no God, sure, that's fine. And uh, I don't think we should be limiting ourselves to a definition and saying, well, I have to fit into that little hole there because that's the definition of that hole that fits in that hole. Me, it's like, I don't give a uh, damn, and I'm not going to live my life according to anybody's belief. I believe that there is probably no God, and, uh, and uh, I'm not going to live my life as if uh, there was going to be a God, or if there was no God, I'm just, I mean, as if there was possibly a God, I'm living my life as if there is no God, and uh, who I don't care about the rest. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think the difference between hard and soft atheist here is the fact that you're slipping the word probably into there. Mm -hmm. I, I believe probably that God, you know, probably doesn't exist. Whereas I'm like, no, I know God doesn't exist. Like you really, it's an undefinable th entity that those who say that he exists even say that he's unknowable. So it's yeah. so undefinable. It's like right. me saying, okay, there's this purple people eater. And just because I've said now that there's a purple people eater, you have to believe that somewhere in the universe it exists mm -hmm. until we can prove it doesn't. And I don't know. I just, I can't fall for that argument at all. Yeah. Um, it's a fictitious thing. It's like thinking that a fictitious character from a book like Harry Potter is actually a person yeah. until we prove he's not. Yeah. You know, you know, Russell's teapot, right? No. Okay. Oh, Bertram Russell. Yes. Yeah. Bertram Russell said, um, imagine that there is a teapot between um, Mars and the asteroid belt, and it's and it's uh, so small that the, with the be biggest telescope in the world you can't see it, but it's there. I know we, it, I'm telling you, it's a, it actually is. It is there. You have no reason to believe that it's there, and for you to and for a person to say um, that uh, uh, I I believe it's not there is perfectly reasonable. Even though he's telling you it's there, he might even be telling you he put it there. But um, but you're saying, I can't see it. You can't prove it's there. I have no reason to believe it's there. And he says, that's a reasonable position. Even, even you know, so, and, and, and that's, and, but, th but that's, that's the way that um, uh, other people's definitions of God are. No matter how much faith they have, no matter how much conviction they have, no matter how many, um, uh, Things they can quote to you of of uh, miraculous experience or revelation or whatever. Um, you, if you don't believe it, it's a reasonable position. Well, I, I think so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, because for me, of course, faith is something that you require when you're beyond all reason. So you really have to be in a desperate place to to accept faith. Um, and yeah, I just, I, I can't go to this whole idea that this thing might possibly exist. So we better start believing like it does. Otherwise, you know, the universe will just, we'd spend so much time trying to disprove the unprovable that it, we wouldn't get any work done. Nothing right. would get done. Yeah. I go by the standard, uh, uh, definition as in, uh, you know, faith is, uh, believing in something this without evidence. So... Yeah, well, that exactly you want to have faith? faith? I'm sorry? That's exactly what faith is, yeah. Mm -hmm. it, that, that's the way I see faith, and, mm -hmm. you know, you have no evidence. Right. Yeah. But the, but people can believe things without evidence. It's not, I mean, it's not, it's, it's that there's nothing wrong with living your life individually, believing things with no evidence. Well, there it's is when, something wrong when you start sacrificing your children well, that's what I was, yeah, or that's, deciding they can't get medical intervention because right. of this belief. Or yeah. Yeah, yeah. They, It can actually be quite dangerous. Uh, right. When, when, you, when, you, when you take it outside yourself. Hmm? When, you, when, you, when you remove it, when you take it past yourself. 
What I'm saying is, for yourself, there's nothing wrong with living your life believing in things un, unknowable. If, you know, but but once you take that beyond yourself, what, like you said, once you start, ta- you know, not giving your kids medicine, once you start trying to put things in textbooks, once you start trying to legislate your morality, then yeah, then you've crossed a line. But, but even even for yourself, I mean, my mother-in-law spent four hours a day praying on pencils. Okay, like huh. really, um, really, really bad for her personal health. Um, <laughs> she just and she, you know, died a miserable, guilt-filled wreck of a human being. And to me, that's just that's such a that's such a pity. What a waste! What yeah. a waste of time. Yeah, I feel sad. I feel sad for like nuns, who people who these people who live their lives devoted to this nonsense idea. I feel bad for them, but. I, I also recognize that if that's how they want to live their life, that's that's I'm not I, I, that's their life if that's how they want to live it. But is, but but when they start when they start doing things like cracking you on this on the knuckles because you use the God's name in vain, that's that's not that's not okay. Or even torturing themselves because they've got some idea that they, you know the more they suffer, like the Mother Teresa syndrome, the more they suffer, the closer they'll get to God. Like, wow. Crazy. Yeah, that is nuts. You're right. She, she's, Absolutely. She's, 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 she's way overrated, Mother Teresa. <laughs> no. She, don't tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> I got really well, upset. Yeah. Well, that's, yeah, it's yeah. like this week. A lot of people are going on and on about the Pope. And they're forgetting that the Pope is against women uh, in the priesthood. He's against marriage. He's against condoms. He's against all sorts of things. Yeah, it's true. I'm sorry. He stopped being the Pope just because he decided to care for the environment. <laughs> That's true. It's, yeah. uh, or care for the poor. He is a great guy, but there are things that I don't agree with, and that's where it ends. I go with yeah. uh, I, I go with what, what my mother told me when I was a child. Don't put anybody on the pedestal, because if you're underneath when they crap, you won't like it. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. You won't. <laughs> yeah. So this so this conversation that you had with this gentleman, you said where was it? I was online somewhere. This is um this is a site called Quora, and it's a question answer website. So you can you can join Quora and pick all sorts of interesting topics to follow. And of course, my topics are you know atheism, theology, mythology, that type of thing. Yeah. And the atheists and the theists just battle it out over there. It's wonderful. Cool. <laughs> That's it. A lot of those those sites con- tend, tend to like come and go. There's like different time. Yahoo Messenger used to be great for that back in the day. Uh, people would get on Yahoo Messenger and back argue back and forth. And there have been other like 4chan and and uh, uh, Reddit. You know, but they, they tend to come and go. You you find these you find these kind of Places where there where an art where like people can get, get together and have arguments and then it lasts for a while and then it goes away and then there's a little time where there's nothing and then something else will come out and fill that void. Well, Cora covers so many topics that even if one topic board decides to go quiet for a while, it, the rest of it's up and running. It really covers just about anything you want to talk about. Um, it was introduced to me earlier in the year and and it's kind of an interesting place just to even watch people who are really smart atheists go through the arguments to mm-hmm. counteract these the, the theists that you know the bible told me so so it must be right type of argument you know? right yeah youtube was good for that for a while too where where uh, people would um, um argue with theists and theists would argue with atheists back and forth in videos and then they changed the way that they did things and you can't do you can't do video responses anymore and is it YouTube sucks now. <laughs> Let's put it this way. Sometimes on YouTube, if you put in a link uh, in your comment, the comment will not show to anybody. It's, it's really weird. Sometimes it will show. Sometimes it won't show. Well, Cora actually wants you to link to resources. They let you do these huge, long answers. In fact, they encourage huge, long answers. If you give really short, pithy, stupid answer remarks, they'll block it. So... It's it's actually designed for quite an in depth um, exchange of ideas. Cool. Yeah, there's a um, there's a book that I read several years ago before the internet, and it was. Um, did you ever read Foucault's Pendulum or um, uh, the Name of the Rose, Umberto Eco? No. Yeah, Our, Umberto Eco was an is an atheist, and um, he got into a, a, a an exchange 
with a uh, Italian theist, and they wrote letters back and forth just having this argument, and somebody turned it into a book. So if you ever get a chance to read it, it was fascinating. But this is before the this is before the internet. This is back when I thought I was the only atheist in the world. <laughs> you have your arguments through snail mail. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so that was pretty cool. Um, okay, well, let's go ahead and move on, and let's get into the news. Okay, here's the first story. Islamist terror group Boko Haram has stepped up hit-and-run attacks on innocent civilians in the last few weeks after facing military opposition from countries neighboring their home base in Nigeria. Mostly remembered in the West for their 2014 abduction of 200 schoolgirls in Chibok, Nigeria, the group stages raids into neighboring countries, hitting soft civilian targets and, less frequently, military ones as well. They often use young children to carry suicide bombs into areas and kill dozens of people at a time with little risk to themselves. More than two million people have been forced to flee their homes in Nigeria since 2009, with one of the collective's goals being to topple the government there. More recently, an estimated 800,000 people have been forced to flee the group's activities all across West Africa since June. Following much talk by Western powers and leaders of the African countries where Boko Haram operates, their activities have only been curbed momentarily, and of the 200 kidnapped girls, the 57 who have escaped so far did so by their own actions. Okay, so each week, Nicole um, assigns news stories to all the writers, and we all write our, our news stories, and then he sends me all of the collection of news stories, and I picked three topics for this newscast, or for this uh, podcast. And the reason that I picked this particular story for us to talk about today is because Boko Haram has been forgotten, like all but forgotten, with um, ISIS uh, took over for a for a while. They were like they were like front and center in the news cycle, and then ISIS came out and everybody forgot all about Boko Haram, and they're still there. They're still doing what exactly what they've been doing. They haven't changed. Nothing's changed with Boko Haram, and there's a few countries out there where. They're an active. They're the biggest threat to their to their sovereignty going right now. Boko Haram has um, declared that they want to join the caliphate with ISIS, and uh, uh, so uh, you know the 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 people that are think that are focused on ISIS right now and Syria um, have like all but forgotten Boko Haram. I just want to say that uh, when I pick my stories, the thing is the. Uh, the uh, media uh, have people writing stories all the time about all sorts of things, but it doesn't mean that they pick those stories and put them on, uh, you know, on TV, on the radio, or on the web, and it just stays there in uh, limbo. I go through that limbo and I look for stories that I think could be interesting and uh, give us some uh, variety of information about what happens with religion. And that's why we've been talking about Boko Haram for years before there was even the kidnapping. We were talking about them for a long time and we're still talking about them. Meanwhile, others are just ignoring them. You know, a lot of people also ignore um, Joseph Coney's Lord Resistance Army, which is doing just basically the same thing, but in the name of Jesus. Uh, and and I wonder, you know, when I started reading through that information today about Boko Haram, I wonder if that has, if the, that kind of extremism coming from that part of the world has a cultural backing to it so that you can get basically the same entity doing it for Jesus as is doing it for Mohammed. Um, because um, Joseph Kony and the Lord's Resistance Army has been doing this for a long time. And they've been kidnapping people, and they've been running in and shooting everybody in town, and and it's just it's horrific. It's and it's always in the name of the religion, and uh, you know you have to wonder what what convinces these people that the only way to spread their faith is through outrageous violence. You know, yeah. I, I was actually. Um, 
given the wonderful opportunity to meet one of the survivors of Joseph Coney's army, uh, Grace Arcan, one of the Aboki girls. And so uh, the Lord's Resistance Army ran in and stole all these girls from the school because, you know, gosh, they shouldn't be educated, and took them and spread these women, these young women around to all the generals as sex slaves. She ended up having about like two or three children in the jungle from these generals. And, you know, gosh, what a courageous woman, because didn't she actually escape and run through that jungle, carrying her kids, her, um, some of her children didn't survive, terrible, terrible tragedy. But it's the same modus operandi as Boko Haram. It's this desire that some freak in the jungle needs to be lord of all he perceives and just spreading terror and violence and stealing women and causing mayhem. Like, what? what's with that? The, the Coney thing was really big about, what was it, like seven years ago when a, the, a video uh, was, was like going all over the place? It was like a viral video about Coney? Yeah, there was a young man here in the West who met one of the survivors and did a video about it. And, you know, you can say it was really big back then. This guy wanted Joseph Coney's name to be uh, a household name so everybody knew what was going on. And the, the media persecuted him. I think he ended up having a, a nervous breakdown. But nothing has changed. Joseph Coney still has not been caught. The Lord's Resistance Army is still doing exactly what Boko Haram is doing. You know, they're all running around Africa, killing people and stealing children and, and, and stealing girls and making them sex slaves and selling them to their generals. It's just, there's just some crazy uh, mentality out there that gets these guys to pick a religion and then become this, you know, crazy general to spread the word of that religion. You know, and it really, I think there must be an underlying current that needs to be found to discover what's, What's the motivating factor here? You know, why are they in the jungle doing that? Religion is insane, period. Yeah, but religion <laughs> is here in the West, and we don't have that kind of vigilante religious, you know, church running around stealing your children out of schools in no. the West. No, but we've got people uh, who uh, come up with... Uh, uh, stupid uh, ideas like uh, women who are truly uh, raped cannot become pregnant and ideas like uh, women should not be uh, you know sh should not have access to uh, uh, abortion you know uh, killing people doctors who work in the abortion places you've got the <coughs> the Brian Fishers it's a different scale, but we got them to. Oh, it's they're, they're just as lunatics. It's just a different scale. Yeah. Yeah, plus, we do have we do have um, uh, crazy people like Jim Jones who start out in the West, and then when they can't get their way in the West, they move to the third world where they where where their money talks and uh, get and buy up land and then and then start their cult there. And we have we also do have we there's um there's the there's that Mormon subgroup. Um, that's on the border between Utah and I forget some other state, and, um, and they have like a uh, a little enclave where um, their people are. They, they worship the one guy who's in jail now, but they still worship him. They think he's coming out. Um, so yeah, it it, 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 it it does happen in the West. It doesn't happen on the, on the same scale because we have um, you know we're, enough education here to get around it. And that must be at the level of poverty and lack of education. Mm -hmm. I did read today that 200 um, supporters of Boko Haram turned themselves in today, which is kind of interesting. Um, I don't know what that means in the long run. I think that a Boko Haram has got no choice to, but to let itself be absorbed by ISIS or else they themselves will have their heads chopped off. So, and I'm sure that there's a lot of Boko Haram supporters thinking, well, you know, we were doing the right thing, but ISIS, they're crazy. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, so there's a line to be drawn there, right? But <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's crazy. Yeah. Okay, let's move on number two. Okay, number two it is. According to Islamic tradition, the Prophet Muhammad received the revelation of the Qur'an over a 23-year period, ending in 623 CE. 
The first fully transcribed copy is suspected to have been created in the year 650. However, errant pages found within another Quran in the University of Birmingham Library's Antiquities have been carbon dated, and scientists say it was printed at least six years earlier than the oldest Quran should have been, and possibly before the Prophet himself had been born. The fragments are believed to have been printed between the years 567 and 644 CE. Should the pages prove to be at the older end, they would predate the Prophet's birth by three years. Should they be from the younger end, they would still predate the historical accounts by six years. There has long been a theory that Muhammad did not actually write the Quran, but that he and his followers simply borrowed, to put it mildly, or plagiarized, to put it honestly, pre-existing Bedouin philosophies, altering them slightly to fit a religious and political agenda. While this new finding does not prove that theory, it clearly adds some credence to it. I like that story. Uh-oh. We can't hear have, you. Have we lost him? Okay, so, well, you're here. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm back. Okay. Okay, you're back. Yeah, that was my fault. I hit my I hit my mute while he was reading. Um, uh, we, act, we were having an argument about this story um, uh, before I wrote it. This, he, this was one of them that he assigned to me, and I wrote, the, I wrote the article. And we were having an argument o over whether or, not it's an actual, what is that, whether or not it's actually news. Because... For one thing, I mean, people have known for years that uh, Muhammad didn't exactly come up with all of the ideas in the Quran on his own. The, 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 I mean, Muslims notwithstanding, whether you know what what they what they say, notwithstanding, educated people know he didn't come up with all the all the ideas. But the fact that they, that they found some pages that were carbon dated with a with a window that's that that puts them during his lifetime doesn't really say much. But it's That's also before his life, uh, uh, the first edition. No the, matter which way edition. you look at it, it was printed before the first official version was ever official. made. Official. But, but the carbon dating has a has an accuracy window that you know well, that's, really yeah, be that specific over six years in carbon dating. Right. Yeah. The, the window. The window that they gave. It was. A, it's a. It was a. It was a human lifespan window, and um, and like I, like I said, Muhammad's life fell in there. And even though that they say that the first um, edition wasn't written and wasn't written until 650, that's the first volume. But he was already dead by 650, so it's not like they're saying that the first thing that he ever wrote was 650 because he was dead by 650. No, so, so the very first comp uh, compilation of his writing, the first compilation, right, right. Predates, but that, but, no matter which way you look at it, the first compilation predates the date that the first compilation is supposed to have taken been done right but there would still have been pages because he was already dead by 650 his his writing was his writing right and so there would there would have been pages and somebody could have transcribed a section of it you know we, we just don't know that that wasn't we we, we we can't we can't say definitely that this is something that Muhammad could not have had anything to do with. We just can't. Well, it could can't. have. It could yeah, very well have. I don't think you can even say that Muhammad really had anything to do with the Quran in the first place. It could have been a compilation of laws that they just put to his name later. I mean, right. it's been known to happen. Yeah. Well, with the, with the, with the Bible, um, for example, there are, I mean, there, the linguistic evidence that, um, that uh, um, Matthew and Luke are based on wait, Matthew. Yeah. Matthew and Luke are based on Mark and Q, um, you know, is, uh, is all you need in order to prove to rational people that um, it wasn't different people writing something unique. They were just, they were just copying what, what was already existing. So, um, but but that doesn't that doesn't affect the religious people. The religious people don't care that you know that that about they they don't know any, they don't know about Q. They don't care about Q. They don't want to hear about Q. Don't talk to me about Q. There is no Q. You know, so um, 
Well, you know, and fundamentalists cute. will always say that there's enough of a margin of error in carbon dating. They don't even believe in carbon dating in the first place. So, right. you know, you're, yeah, I don't, I, I it, for me, that wasn't much of a story either because it really atheists will go, see, proves it, but fundamentalists will go, see, proves it. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> does that work? But, by the way, do you know what Q uh, means in French? No. Actually, it's not pronounced exactly quite the same way. It's pronounced Q. And the Q, but it's basically the same thing, and it means ass. <laughs> so, <laughs> so they don't care about Q. <laughs> there is no Q. <laughs> okay. All right, let's go ahead and do the third story. Okay. A case involving the death of a five-year-old Saudi and Egyptian girl who died of brutal injuries inflicted by her own father gained national exposure in Saudi Arabia when it occurred in 2012. Luma, as the girl is known, was born to an Egyptian woman who already had three older half-Saudi children from a previous marriage when her second Saudi husband divorced her while she was pregnant with Luma. A judge ordered custody in her favor but insisted that the child's father be given two weeks of visitation each year. However, the father, Fayan al-Ghamdi, was a former drug addict turned preacher who suspected his kindergarten age daughter was not a virgin, refused to return his daughter at the appointed hour. Sometime later, the mother was informed that her daughter was comatose in a hospital, having been beaten by her father with wires and a poker. The girl died four months later. Following a sensational trial and conviction during which it was alleged that the child may have also been sexually assaulted, al Gamdi was sentenced to 10 years on a manslaughter finding, as well as 800 lashes. The mother was given the opportunity to request the death sentence, but opted instead to settle for a million Saudi rials in blood money to help her raise her surviving family. However, after an autopsy found no evidence of semen on the child, the manslaughter conviction was overturned, and al Gamdi has been released, having served three years. His lawyer plans to sue the media for besmirching the child's good name. The, uh, don't think it's a child, but the father's good name, the, yeah. that's what they meant. I think I misread that, but uh, yeah, he uh, this this story is um, so relevant today because this is a country that was just accepted into the UN's um, human rights um, uh, subdivision. Yeah, this, a Saudi Arabian gentleman was put at the head of the UN Human Rights um, Council. Yeah, Human Rights Council. You know, yeah. it's just like outrageous how can how can that happen really that's brutal yeah 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 it just goes to show the un is really a, such just such a ridiculous organization well i it? wonder how much money should swap hands on that one it was like seeing the saudi arabian guy at the head of the photo lineup after uh the charlie hebdo shootings it's like, what is that man there for? Really? Yeah. <laughs> you know, if they're going to be doing what they're doing to Rafe, and I guess this young teenage boy who's about to be crucified as well, um, and we he's and the Saudi Arabians are going to stand up for him with Je suis Charlie on, you know, that's just, wow, that's something else. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of that uh, uh, young man that you just mentioned, uh, we are going to um, talk about that today. Uh, he... Um, uh, is uh, he, when he was 16 years old, he participated in um, the uh, Arab Spring movement. So he wasn't he wasn't even adult by their standards when he did what he did, and what he did was nothing. It was it was to participate. But his father is also um, a, a problem for the government. So they're going to they're not just going to execute this kid. You know, they're going to crucify, literally, literally crucify this kid. They're going to hang him on a cross. And He's, meanwhile, and, this and man after, who's beaten his child to death, it gets to walk after three years. Um, you know, the, you had called it blood for oil, the, the article, because the mom had decided to mm -hmm. take a million Saudi Arabian dollars um, instead of having this guy executed for killing her child. Um, and now he's mm -hmm. going to even sue her to get the money back. You know, like this, this is brutal. He's going to get away with the brutal murder, murder of his daughter. He's going to leave this Egyptian woman impoverished with three other children. He's going to walk. He's probably going to get paid compensation because his name is being supposedly slandered. 
Uh, right. And meanwhile, this teenage kid is just about to be crucified for being standing up for rights for humans. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Actually, yeah. he's going to be beheaded, then crucified. You know. Really? That's weird. That's okay. Weird. Yeah. I didn't. I didn't see that in the story. All I saw was that he. Was, yeah. I mean, they okay. might as well get down and just draw and quarter the boy. I mean, like, how barbaric do you got to go in yeah. your sensing of your laws? And yeah. I yeah. only mentioned the fact that he was going to be beheaded first because, you know, to show how ridiculous that is, you know. Like, once yeah. he's been beheaded, what's the point of crucifying him? What it's, does right. it change? He's dead. Well, and isn't that just shocking the rest of the people to keep them in line? Because yep. they're going to see that the, the body is desecrated. They're so, you know, they're so attached to what happens to the body after death that if you go and desecrate a body like that, that's worse than actually being killed. So, yeah. But see, I, 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 don't, understand. I don't think you're right, though, because I'm reading in this story, it says, it's, it, it says in the story that I, that I linked to you, the young man's case has been subject to fervent campaigning from rights groups, including Amnesty International and Reprieve, who say he was tortured and forced to sign a false confession before being sentenced to death by crucifixion. So they can't behead him and then kill him through crucifixion. Well, yeah. I'm sure it's beheading before, though. I, I read that. I'm going to double check. It would make more okay. sense to try to crucify him first and then behead him after several days yeah. on the cross, right? Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. And death, crucifixion, this is another thing too. Crucifixion, a lot of uh, the people generally have a false idea about what crucifixion is because of the Bible. The Bible gives really gives a, a soft idea of what crucifixion is because Jesus dies like within the day on the cross. But people don't die in a day from crucifixion. They, 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 crucifixion is all about public suffering. That's what they, that's what it's for. You don't die. There's no, there's no way to die from, so gets you, you don't die from exsanguination. You don't die from and suffocation. You die from exposure to the elements. Yeah. And probably dehydration. So it dehy probably right. take you, you know, three to four days to right. die. Yeah. And yeah. we got uh, some noise for a second because uh, I went to a CNN page and uh, something started playing. And on okay. CNN, it does say that it's going to be first beheading and then an okay. additional rare punishment of crucifixion. Okay. The independent, the independent uh, UK uh, conflicts with that. So we don't know. Um, but uh, yeah, there's two different versions of what they're going to do, depending on who, depending on which source you get your news from. But either way, it's ridiculous. It, it, yeah, it's it bar it's barbaric. We can you know really say this. It's totally barbaric. I have no idea why it is that Saudi Arabia happens to be, you know, allies to um, all of us because they the the money must the money strings must be so strong that we just turn a blind eye to this barbaric. Um, way of living and then give them things like you know this commission to be the head of the uh human rights <laughs> commission for the un like right which means which, uh, which makes I'm, the whole commission sorry, i just want to say i'm leaving you guys for a couple of minutes and i'll be right back okay well don't be gone long we miss you um but, uh, <laughs> the uh the uh un right okay so they have this human rights commission when you put somebody like Saudi Arabia in the, in the top of, in the head of it, what it it loses all value for not just you, not just for what happens in Saudi Arabia, but everywhere. Are they going to stand up to Russia? Are they going to stand up to um, you know uh, Boko Haram? Are they going to stand up to ISIS? You know, or, or if they do, why should why would ISIS care? Why would anybody care? Why would anybody take any 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 credence from it when they're in their in their own country doing what they're doing? It, that's true. It's taken all credit for me. It's taken all credibility away from the commission. You know, really, there's there's no point when such atrocities are happening on a daily basis. You can't even let your women drive. I mean, how can you be standing <laughs> up for human rights? <laughs> I know exactly, that's, and that's I don't even I don't even get that thing with the uh, with the women driving. It's it's like I, what 
where in the Quran does it say anything about driving? Where do they even get this idea that women can't, that women shouldn't be able to drive? What does it, do you, do you even know what it's based on? What it's, what it's. You know, when I, when we were at the World Religious Conference a couple of years ago, um, it was about freedom, believe it or not. Um, and so I asked a question of the Yemen there about if somebody wanted to, if a woman wanted to leave, you know, Islam, would you let her? basically. And he came back saying, uh, you know, essentially that heaven, what is the quote? Heaven rests at the foot of the mother. And, um, <laughs> and, and it was at that time that this huge roar of appreciation came from the mezzanine where all the women were. And I had no idea. I was there all day long. I had no idea there were women at this conference because they were all segregated way up in the mezzanine. They weren't actually allowed down on the main floor. And he said this in this huge roar, and I thought, you know, this is this is ridiculous. You could tell these women that paradise rests at their feet to sort of give them some sort of special status. But special status is dangerous. The second you've decided that she requires special status, it means now that she can no longer be human. Mm -hmm. Because humans make mistakes, and humans have desires. But as a woman in Islam, if you make a mistake or show a desire... You're no longer worthy of paradise, so now we get to beat you to death. <laughs> you know, like, <Yeah. laughs> it's like, I don't want to be put at that pedestal. I don't want paradise at my feet. Mm -hmm. And, of course, what it also suggests to women in that culture is that unless you take on the mantle of mother, you have no value. So any woman who decides not to be married or not to have children is automatically you know, worthy of rape and death because right. she or, has no or, value. Or a woman who's barren. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's, so I, I have argued this line to Islamic women, Islamic men. They really take offense when I pick on this line of, of heaven resting at the foot of the mother. Um, but there there is the, and I'm not going to remember her name, but a woman who, um, she's created a film about... Um, uh, 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 about rape, the rape culture within within the Middle East, and and the catch line is, you know, culture is not an excuse for abuse. It was quite a powerful documentary, mm -hmm. but I pointed this out to her, and again, she took huge offense that I would question this line. After about five minutes arguing with her, she thought, you know, there's actually an interesting talking point here. Maybe being put up on a pedestal is what. Um, is is part of the problem. You know, they're not humans mm -hmm. anymore. So yeah. you can't have them drive because that puts paradise out in a car. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know? yeah. And for people who didn't know this, uh, unless uh, you're viewing this uh, podcast, I am back. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> Welcome back. <laughs> if they didn't know it before, they know it now. Um, yeah, but uh, yeah, if, if paradise is at a woman's foot, then you don't want the gas pedal there. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's go ahead and do the Christian glitches. Okay, prepare yourself for a special treat. But see, if the Bible is the Word of God, it has to be 100% accurate 100% of the time. If you can find one flaw in the Bible, you can throw the Bible out knowing it is not God's Word. It is a short one, but I picked it for a reason. And the reason I picked it is because they, this guy, Andrew Rappaport, just confirmed what I always believed. If, you know, as far as they're concerned, as far as the fundamentalist creationists, idiots are concerned, Every word of the Bible ha must be true as soon as you can question one of them, then you have to throw the whole thing out. And that's what the guy is saying right there. As soon as part of the, as soon as part of the Bible is uh, proven wrong, the whole Bible it goes out the drain. And right. that's yeah. what I've always thought about them. And that's so funny. I had this conversation with a woman again on Quora, you know, about that. And, uh, and of course, my response to that is, which Bible? Like, what, what Bible are you actually going to choose for this 
exercise and she came back and said you know of course it's the king james version and <laughs> and that to me says yeah exactly that's the problem but she couldn't figure out that what i was talking about i mean the bible has been rewritten so many times it's stupid and the king james version you know written by committee again after the committee after right. committee putting this thing together you know, how, how can you think this thing's infallible when you can actually say, I'm going to choose version number 10 to believe in? <laughs> right. Well, the, and the fact that the Bible contradicts itself, I mean, a million times, but um, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John conflict with each other. Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 conflict with each other. So, and, and that's the foundation of all of it. You know, if, if the Gospels conflict and the, and the, and the creation story conflicts, then it it's it falls apart as a as a literal as a as a literal translate as a literal as a literal entity. It's, it's true. It falls apart. Child sacrifice, not child sacrifice. <laughs> yeah. <to> decide. <laughs> yeah. 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 There's a there's a there's an online um, uh, tool that uh, was worked like like four different guys worked on it at different times. Like for, the first guy just did a. Made up a graph uh, that shows like arcs of of all the contradictions in the Bible, and then another guy made it interactive, and then another guy made it um, so that uh, the, the the interactive aspects are are um, spelled out. You know, so if, there, if, if, if I can't think of what the what the what it's called, but I'll I'll find it. And I'll put it in the show notes. But it's just amazing. Have you seen it? It's just it shows like a yes, it shows I all have. the books of the Bible, and then all these arcs showing all the contradictions, and it looks like just a, 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 the most beautiful fireworks display because it's like all these tracer lines going everywhere it's crazy how many contradictions there are in the bible but yeah so for this guy to say if you can prove just one thing wrong then the whole bible falls apart what how does he what how is he rationalizing all of this this is a... well that's why i called uh, uh this segment you know actually uh, uh cognitive dis uh, dissonance because it makes no sense, and yet it shows how fragile their entire system is. It's mm -hmm. all built, you know, on uh, uh, what's in French we call it a chateau de cartes, you know, a uh, card castle. You know, somebody who built you know a house of cards, and as soon as you pull one, everything falls apart. Mm -hmm. You know, this has everything to do with lack of education. My uh, my sister-in-law is a young earther. She honestly believes the earth is only 6,000 years old. And um, her husband found a globe and brought it home. And the question she posed was, why is it broken? Why is it on an angle? <laughs> and she calls my husband and asks him this question, you know, because we have a telescope and like to watch the stars. So we tend to know these things. And he's like, really? Because you learned this in high school. So, and she did. I mean, she was educated here. And so we learned all of this in high school about why the earth is tilted on an angle and how our seasons happen and, you know, how it spins and how it rotates. And, and she had actually chosen to forget it all and had no idea why it is that we actually experience seasons. And it's just like, wow, like that was so basic. My, my 13 year old nephew could tell you that. <laughs> and yet as an adult, you've chosen to forget it. We just, these people just choose. They decide to go for faith and all reason slips out the other side of their brain or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But but and then but then to say if you can find um, flaws in the Bible that there can't be any flaws in the Bible because it, that's just he's making like like Nicole says he's making an atheist argument he's not making a Catholic he's not making a Christian argument he th but he's he he somehow convinced himself that that is a valid argument for Christians. Well, he'll never know it because he's probably never read the Bible from beginning to end. He's yeah. probably just takes scriptures out, picks and chooses, right? Yeah, right. So that was it. That was uh, this uh, week's Christian glitches. Okay. Well, that was an interesting one. Who was who was that guy exactly? His He's name a is Rapp Rappaport. Yes, actually, he is an ex uh, Jew who uh, has converted to uh, Christianity. Yep. And he, okay. 
And even he thinks the Bible is 100% accurate. Absolutely. Somebody, somebody who was raised in the Jewish tradition. <laughs> yes. Oh, my God. I can understand it if somebody born to it <laughs> and, and, and had no, no other exposure. But this guy was raised in the Jewish tradition. I don't know. Okay. All right. Well, anyway. Um, Nicole, do you have anything coming up? Uh, no, I have nothing coming up. Right. Well, I'm working again this weekend on a uh, different uh, conference uh, speaker from uh, the non-conference that uh, I attended and Jack's attended as well. You know, it's going to be interesting because uh, there's lots and lots of uh, there were lots of great speakers. And uh, for example, uh, let me see. Oh, yes, we've got Stephanie uh, Gutterson, uh, who's coming up. Uh, she was great. She was fantastic. Uh, she was for, fantastic. And I understand she's got another lawsuit being pushed against her from that crazy um, religious guy who who she's been fighting with for years and years. So The, the slow talker? Um, this is this she this is a you know a faith healer. Yeah, the slow talker. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He did you see the video? <laughs> no, not completely, but he, I can... he's he, he's talking and he does I swear to God, I'm not, this is not an exaggeration. He does he does he does this. He said I, I'm not gonna, I don't remember what he said, but I'll I'll just I'll just make up something. He said, the way that we heal Is that? <laughs> and she, and and that's she, because he's making it up as he goes along. It's he's awful. Talking. It was awful. <laughs> so, we've I've got all sorts of great uh, speakers coming up, including Mr. Deity. I've got uh, Lawrence T uh, Krauss. It's all going to be on my channel. Uh, you know, this is an exclusive for Nicolisti. You know, it's uh, the non-conference that took place in Kitchener on August the 22nd. And I'm uh, working uh, my ass off to make sure we have at least one con one speaker per week. And that's two weeks in a row, one speaker each. Next week, we'll have another speaker. It's going to be great. Well, thanks for all that work. That's going to be that's going to be awesome to see them. It was an, it was a great day. So, Jax, um, other than the secular, uh, the, the secular, sacred secular sa sanctuary, sacred secular sanctuary, um, do you have any other online presence that I mean, other than Cora, <laughs> that you would like to let people know about? Like, are you on Twitter or any of those type of things? I'm I'm an artist, and uh, and I do Facebook a lot. Uh, you can find me under Jax Rula. But um, I'm a fiber artist. I actually make art dolls. And so you can find my art dolls under uh, Facebook as well. There's a Circle Works page, which is the name of my studio. And the project that I'm working on right now called A Grand Fabrication. So you can find that there as well. Good. Okay, very good. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, bring the show to a close, there, unless anybody has anything to add. Well, I just want to make sure that uh, Jax will give us the uh, link for Cora so that we can put it also in the show notes. Yeah, and and all of your all of your uh, Facebook links too. Just make sure you get them to Nicole. You can just message him on Skype, and we'll put them in the show notes. Sure. Thanks very much. This has been a lot of fun. Good. Okay. Well, that's all for today. Please make sure that you subscribe to the Atheism TV channel on YouTube. There you uh, can watch the Infidel News for the Damned, where our talented team of writers and anchors present these and other stories not normally covered in the media. In the coming week, the Infidel will rerun today's stories and many more fascinating ones. You'll find Atheism TV at youtube.com slash Atheism TV. The Infidel Podcast of the Damned is a Nicole SD production. Nicole and I would like to recognize and say thank you to Truth Surge, who did the voiceover used in our intro and gave us permission to use music from his song Lied To as our opening theme. We'd also like to thank Jax Rula for participating in today's podcast. Nicole's channel is Nicole SD and can be found at youtube.com slash N-I-C-O-L-S-D. I'm Gamut Man on YouTube, at Gamut Man on Twitter, and my blog and information on my books, including my nonfiction title, Believe It, You Know an Atheist, as well as my mystery novels featuring the atheist detective Lupa Schwartz, can be accessed at tinyurl.com slash lupalanding. While there, you can sign up to receive my newsletter. Signing up also entitles you to choose one free ebook title from my collection of 99-cent novellas. Thank you for watching, and Nicole and I will see you next week. Have a great day, guys. Thanks, everyone.
Thank you.